Hello and welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. This is your host Greg Payne coming at you from Studio 12. This podcast is about being the best possible grandpa you can be. Focusing on what it is to be a grandpa and how we can all share that experience together for our grandchildren. Hello everybody. I want to introduce a slightly different format for this episode. This is going to be part one of two parts uh, regarding Major General Rupertus. Now, I have Heather Bates, Kim Robinson, and Amy Peacock that I'm interviewing together. In this episode, what we're doing is getting together to talk about what was driving these granddaughters who have never met their grandfather to go through all of his records, his memorabilia, as well as reaching out to the U.S. Archives and the United States Marine Corps and other groups to find the general's history and to put that together. Amy is currently writing a book about her grandfather, and this just, it was an interesting subject that I wanted to spend some time on. So that's why we're breaking it up into two parts. So this first part is going to be great, and you're going to enjoy hearing the story, and you're going to enjoy hearing about how these sisters all work together to support Amy in writing the book and doing the research about her grandfather. Now, anybody that is interested in family history, anybody that's interested in going through and documenting and finding old service records is really going to want to pay attention to this episode. One of the things that we do on this episode is putting all of the links to into the show notes. Now, we're talking about links about how to go to the U.S. Marine Corps History Center, uh, the National Archives, a number of different tools that are used to gather family history and do documentation. So what you want to do is listen to this podcast and then go to my website at www.cool-grandpa.com. Dot us, look for this episode, and then you're going to see a ton of links that these sisters have provided for us that can help you and help anybody you know that's doing family history be able to research their family members even a little bit better. So uh, you guys are really going to enjoy this. And again, this is part one. So we're talking about the research. We're talking about some of the mechanics of what the sisters have gone through with researching their grandfather, Major General William Rupertus. Welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. We've got a a special treat. We've got three wonderful women that are going to be on today, and they're going to be talking about their grandfather. First, we'll start out with Heather. And Heather, just say hi and give a brief introduction of yourself. Hi, I'm Heather Bates, and I live in Northern Virginia. And I'm a grandmother of three um, grandkids, two boys and a girl, all under six, and I have a son in the Navy who is the um, parent of those grandkids. So I'm very excited to be here. Oh, well, thanks. And Kim, how about you? Um, well, I'm Kimberly Robinson, and I live in uh, Southern California, and I've been out here for quite some time. Obviously, grew up in the Washington, D.C. area and um, moved out just after college. And um, I've been enjoying um, working on this project and I have a son who is graduated college and out on his own and uh, I'm an empty nester. So we're empty nesters actually, I guess you'd say. So uh, um, yeah, happy to be here and happy to work, have been working on this project. No, oh, thank you. And Amy? Um, I'm Amy Peacock um, and we live in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina moved down here in 2003 from Northern Virginia with my husband. And we have two children who are now um, 16 and 17. It's great. And um, we're busy. (laughs) We're in that, that busy time. Sure. So doing virtual school now. And um, so it's good that we're all home together. Sure. And um, anyway, so yeah, that's it. Okay. Well now, we wanted to introduce your, your grandfather and talk a little bit about the, his story, a little bit about the story of you guys starting to come together to do the research on his life. And so who would want to do the introduction about your, about your grandfather? Well, I'd kind of like to, um, uh, our grandfather, this is Amy speaking, 
Our grandfather was Major General William H. Rupertus. People referred to him as Bill or Rup um, for shortening of Rupertus. And he was a um, um, compassionate man and a military uh, hero. Uh, he loved his country, his family, and the United States Marine Corps. Um, he uh, served in the Marine Corps from uh, 1915, you guys correct me, but all the way through 1945 when he died. So he he was all the way, um, uh, he, he uh, before that he was in the Revenue Cutters School, but when he got, which is the predecessor to the U.S. Coast Guard, he, but in, he was in World War II, uh, World War I, he was in Haiti, and then he went to China. He was, did two, two tours of China with the famous uh, China Marines. Um, and then when he got to the Pacific, um, or when the Japanese bombed uh, Pearl Harbor, he was uh, out west and um, in San Diego, and he, um, as an expert rifleman, because he served on the rifle team um, with the Marine Corps, he penned the Rifleman's Creed, which um, the Marines recited, and it's pretty well known for people who know. And then um, knowing what the the uh, young soldiers that were joining the Marine Corps after the, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, um, he knew what they would be facing in the Pacific. So he went on to lead to be um, assistant division commander of the 1st Marine Division in the Pacific and eventually the commander of the Marine 1st Marine Division in the Pacific. And he was in some of the bloodiest battles in the Pacific. And we know they were all bloody, but he was in some particular really tough ones and um, and was the longest serving um, commandant of the, the um, or not commandant, the um, commander of the uh, uh, division. Uh, and he was out there in the Pacific for a long time, as were many of the men. And he also has a destroyer named after him, USS Rupertus. And there's still, although the USS Rupertus is retired, there's still an active association meets. Well, with COVID, they're not meeting, but they're meeting virtually. Um, but they've been meeting for years. Um, that battleship or destroyer uh, served um, all the way through uh, Vietnam. And it was sold to the Greek Navy. And now it's in the sea with coral all over it. Oh yeah, where where yeah. did where did they sink it? Uh, it's off the coast of Greece somewhere. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it really didn't. It, I don't. It did not get retired. I believe until the early '80s. I can fact check yeah. that. The Greek Navy used it for a while. Okay. Did I do a good enough job, ladies? Well, my only two cents would be um, he was part of the DC National Guard prior to uh, the Revenue Cutter Service Academy, so there was that that um, bit of service there. So. So it dates uh, way back, and obviously none of us ever knew him. And he uh, died in 1945 when my father was five years old. So he's been quite a mystery and um, is very interesting. <laughs> it's been very interesting for us to consider who he was all these years. We had an idea of who he was, but we never really knew because we never knew him. We only knew from the people that were still living that knew him. Well, read this. This is uh, when I first started writing, I thought I knew a lot about him and I realized I knew nothing. And as I went further, I started out with the first page and the second page. And I'm like, that's wrong. That's wrong. And this is five years ago. Um, <laughs> it says our grandfather, um, Major General William H. Rupertus Bill was a compassionate man and a military hero. He loved his country and the United States Marine Corps. We never met him. He died of a heart attack when our father was just five years old. That was in 1945. We also never met his wife, our grandmother, Sleepy Rupertus, because she died when our father was 15 in 1955. Her sister, our Aunt Jo, Josephine Hill Carter, Aunt Jo, um, helped guide our father through those tough times. She was a gem, and boy, did she know the family, Navy, and Marine Corps history. And then it goes on. <laughs> Uh, he was born in Washington, D.C. You know, um, his parents were uh, German. His grandparents were German immigrants. There was a huge, as we've talked about this, Greg, a huge um, German community in Washington that we never knew about growing up until we did this research. And so we knew a little bit going on, but that, that basically is our grandfather. So we had this, this guy who was a legend that died in 1945, that was this Marine Corps general in the Pacific, that was in some bloody battles. Destroyer was named after him. He wrote the Rifleman's Creed, but we never met him. And for years, our father has been trying to cook. Our father went to the, you know, he was an orphan at 15, and then he went on to the Naval Academy. And then 
the Marine Corps and was a Marine Corps aviator. And all during this time, he's trying to figure out, does he have any connection? And so we've been re researching this as a family for about 65 years. Well, and this is what was so interesting about the story is that there is such a gap between when your grandfather passed and you guys, um, mm -hmm. meaning that one of my grandfathers passed when I was about two years old. So for me to go back and talk to my dad about him and learn a lot, there, there was a lot of history that was readily available. My grandmother was there, aunts, uncles, people that, you know, so if I was inclined, I could have easily found out a lot. But so much time had passed between when he'd passed and then I think when you guys were starting to get interested in this, that it's really fascinating about the story about what was pulling you guys to start to go through the awards, go through the diaries, go through that stuff versus just leaving it in the back of the attic and just, you know, kind of caretaking it, but not really diving into it. Well, I, I'd like to weigh in here just briefly. Um, I think part of it was when you die, um, before something is finished, you don't have the option to speak truth to whatever. And so we'd see PBS Winds of War and all this other stuff and scholars continue to copy each other over and over, never coming to the family who have the actual documents that can truthify, if you will, right. speak, speak to that. So there was that was part of what we wanted to address and part of what got us going, I think. And um, when you have such a trove of documents to go through and you've your great aunt has beat this into your head years and years and years and pass it on to your kids and all that. You really feel like you are becoming the caretakers of the story. Sure. And so what do you do with it? Right. That's just what it is. It's a story. We've always been so compelled by the story, you know, of the Marines and our Jenner, our grandfather going to the Pacific sleepy and our dad, our grandmother sleepy being back in Washington and, and, and be, even before that, when he was in China as a China Marine protecting the international settlements, I mean, it's all, it's such a cool story, like a cool grandpa, yeah. it's a cool story. And so we've always been fascinated with it. Like we should do something with this. It was just, we should do something with it. Okay. So that's, and, and it, roots. It's always been very intriguing. And we've heard uh, stories from people over the years and some stories from my father, but not the whole story, little bits and pieces. And then mementos and artifacts were in the house, obviously. We grew up living with things that my grandparents, our grandparents got in their travels. My, my grandfather brought back from his travels, you know, certificates and medals and things displayed, but um, we didn't know all the details of the stories behind those things. So it was very, always very intriguing. So do you think that there was part of this that was wanting to set the record straight and, and, and fill in the gaps? Like, you know, it, it, I'm making this up, right? So if he had a sword that had been given to him by somebody or a baton or, or something, there was a le there was a family legend around it. But then when you start digging into it, it's like, well, that's not, that's, that's not accurate at all. So was there that drive to uh, let's figure out fact from fiction a little bit? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, set the record straight. And, you know, even working with the Marine Corps, the historian there said, you know, when you there's silence, it creates a problem. And there's silence for, since 1945. And you can really, by, by doing this work, you can contribute to the database of history and get the facts right. Yeah, so I will just interject there. Greg, what you were mentioning was it's sort of like the, the folk tale about certain items that we might yeah. have seen. And I think it's it's uh, more accurate to say that we heard things, you know, what like Amy said, that didn't jive with what we saw it, yeah. without even doing a deep dive into our, you know, uh, collection. You know, it didn't really sync with what we saw as of the person. So we ended up discovering a lot more that set the record straight. Sure. sure. For us, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. For us, yeah, yeah well, for us too. Well, and it's it's certainly one of those things where it's not the case of going in to try to knock down the legend or knock down that story, but it's a case of let's get this thing right because 
the the actual story is probably even more interesting and more impactful than the legend was. Oh, it's it's an amazing story, actually. I mean, just this is one thing I commend on Amy writing the book is when I was reading, when I got to the battle part, I mean, I am not a person who reads books about battles, but I was just <laughs> so like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, it was it was like, wow. I think that, you know, my sisters kind of were like, what do you mean? I carry all the genealogy, right? Okay. I carry the bin. And so Kimberly came over to visit once we're going through. And she's like, what? You have this? And you have this? I know you have this. And yeah, so that kind of moves into this, the how we started on the book. Right. And, and that's one of the things I wanted to touch on, too, was the methodology for how you, the three of you are going through the artifacts, the diaries, and then also how are you starting to reach out to the Marine Corps? So let's talk a little bit about how did you guys start to organize probably different collections of artifacts and, and start to organize those amongst yourselves? You want to go, Kimberly? Um, well, I, I would say that, like Heather touched on briefly, uh, she really started out with she was sort of given the mantle uh, from my mother of pursuing more of the genealogy. My, my mother had my father's genealogy done um, when he was, I think it was 40. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a great deal of, of work was done in, in that regard. But um, then Heather picked, picked up where, uh, where she left off after she passed away or just prior to it. And mom, uh, what's that? To clarify after mom passed away. Yeah. After mom passed away. Um, Oh, shoot. Now I lost my train of thought. The talk the, about Heather's the I had and what transpired to start yeah. the research. I mean, like Amy mentioned, uh, we've all been interested in, in researching this over the years. My father, we found documents where my father was reaching out to certain people to find more information. Uh, but it, I think it just all started becoming a little bit it was it, it's rather overwhelming to hear things and to read things when you're interested in the story and you want to learn about the story it's rather overwhelming and disappointing to see things portrayed in in other written works and by other historians and so on that are not accurate so i think it, it was beginning to frustrate us all a lot and i think we all felt like something needed to be done but leave it to little sister to pick up the flag and, you know, really charge ahead because she's the one that really decided that, you know, she needed to start taking a pen to paper and writing it down. Well, Greg, it's like what we talked about. So how this happened, we literally mm -hmm. over the years, and I have, I've figured it out on, um, and I wrote it in our Facebook page for the group, but over time, everybody in our family, because my dad was an orphan, he didn't have any brothers or sisters. And so when his parents died and then he died, I mean, it was like, and then mom died, it was like zip. And then the aunt Joe died. It was like all, it was like gasping for air. We had no, our roots were gone. Right. And so all we had left were these trunks of information that were like, you know, <laughs> our connection <laughs> to calling to us. <laughs> yeah. 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 So over time, you know, I've interviewed folks. Kimberly's done stuff. Heather's done a lot of ancestry research. Um, we knew this is a good story that we should do something. And it was really only until um, this other author who's a Navy guy was writing a book, another book called um, about Captain Jerry Yellen, who uh, he, this book is called The Last Fighter Pilot. He was researching the Pacific and he came across our grandfather and he said, Amy, I'm Facebook Messenger, he's like, you know, is this, um, is this your grandfather? And I'm like, yeah, is this a picture of your grandfather? It was from Shanghai, 1937, a picture of he and a bunch of uh, his friends and Sleepy. And I, he's like, wow, you need to write a story about this. You need to write this for history or for your family and history. Get it down before it's too late. Right. And that was like, oh my God, before it's too late. I'm like, you know, we're not getting any younger. And I was <laughs> I was thinking, and, and it just dawned on me, you know, we lost our parents. Our dad died when he was 51. Our mom died of ALS when she was 64. 63. You know, she got 63. Yeah. And it's like, my thought was, yeah, you got to get this down for the family and history before it's too late. 
And my fear was, what if our kids just didn't care about this stuff and threw it away? Like, like you look online yeah. and some, some of the people that we've met or some, some people that we've met in history, some of their stuff mm -hmm. is like on eBay. And we're like, these are really, really important figures in history and Marines whose family wouldn't keep this stuff. But, you know, maybe the grandchildren just said, we don't want to carry this around. Yeah. A lot of times I, I think, too, I, I've seen a few different articles uh, about people that are trying to reunite as an example of this. Right. Uh, purple hearts that they pick up at pawn shops or whatever. Oh, yeah. Where it's, it, you know, it's grandkids, great grandkids. There's no story there. There's no connection. It's stuff, right? It, it, it moves from being a family treasure to becoming just stuff. And so, you know, when those medals get returned to the family and somebody can appreciate what's going on, that's huge. And then the other thing, too, that I point out with a lot of the people that I, I talk about or, or interview is that, you know, when we're talking with our grandparents, you know, we have almost maybe a hundred years at this point of family memory, of oral, at least oral memory that we have, right? And you guys, with your grandfather, even a little bit more than that, uh, with his lifespan going back into the late 19th century. Um, so, you know, it's, it's super important to be able to take that time and, and find that passion to, to learn about the ancestors and, and learn about the story because it can be inspiring even if you don't have that direct living connection with, with somebody. Right. And I think the, the way it started with us, Amy decided she was going to write the book and she had about, she would write like two or 300 pages and flip it around to us so we could edit. And finally she, she called us all to Charlotte. I, I flew down, I drove down, Kimberly flew in. I bought what I had and it was literally spread all over the dining room table, all the chairs into the living room. It was by year, by battle, by this. I mean, it was, right. it was an unwieldy amount of information, but the idea was to put it in a way um, into you know, files and all that. So Amy could easily access things when she needed to research something and especially important for when she had quotations for her book. But just doing that was a huge deal because a lot of in the old days and still today, there was a lot of, there were a lot of newspaper articles that people would, you know, oh, this person, this battle, whatever. And it go in a, <laughs> in some place. So everything got much more organized, which is a huge step when, when you're doing research like this. And what we did, you know where we, the gaps are then, you know? Yeah. yeah. We didn't know Heather had all these letters, <laughs> <laughs> letters that our grandfather's written to our grandmother. And, You've been and slowly pulling things out, like pulling slowly, but surely <laughs> we discover something else that's stored at Heather's. But, you know, it is really important that we are all able to come together and work together and bring our individual little treasures that somehow things got split up. But for the most part, Amy, Amy had a good share of things in this in this chest that was belonged to my grandfather. And then I had some books and some scrapbooks and Heather had some correspondence and some other things having to do with ancestry and so on. And genealogy. Yeah. And um, it, yeah, and so we all agreed that we'd bring what we had and we would, you know, bring it to Amy's so that it was readily the the source documents, the originals were at her place so that she could easily access them. Over two and, and, and a half and days. Or, yeah, two and a half right. days. Grade long, stayed longer because it was just, or maybe you both did, I can't remember, but it was so overwhelming. But just just the stuff we had alone mm -hmm. um, that, that has been saved since our grandfather died. And then Kimberly kind of took it a step further. So I think we should maybe move on to the methodology a yeah. little bit. But Kimberly, why don't you tell them? Well, I have had a little bit of experience with archiving and research in other work that I've done, but not a lot. I mean, I pretty much learned on the fly, but you know, we all, we, we had to figure out how things were gonna get sorted at Amy's house. So ultimately <laughs> it ended up getting, it was a, 
little bit of a scuffle there, but it ended up being um, uh, pretty much uh, sorted by battle because that's felt what she felt comfortable with. And then while a lot of that was being done, I was trying to scan as much as possible into the scanner. And um, I, I think so, but I believe for access, it, it was easier to, to kind of organize things chronologically. So I started a secondary um, kind of uh, resource, which was Dropbox. So I started putting everything that I had scanned onto a Dropbox so that we could all access it. And the idea was that everyone was gonna add things to Dropbox as they came up, but it really ended up me adding more to Dropbox as things went along because Amy was busy writing the book and those that, that wasn't something that she was available to do. So, you know, Amy got her draft together, but you know, there were still, we needed to go through the process of verifying what we have. We had correspondence to and from him from various people um, and, we had ideas of what we believed were facts, but we also wanted to find other source materials, other primary source materials that would support the documents that we had and the, um, and the narrative that Amy was developing. Sure. No. So, um, so we started reaching out to, uh, Amy had reached out to the Marine Corps History Division and so we all met there and we did some research there. And um, basically we just, it, it sort of unfolded from there. You know, you, you find that you have, the methodology really was just a desire to, to, um, to get primary source material. And so go to the source, go to the national archives. Amy requested uh, my grandfather's uh, uh, military service records and they had a significant amount there and it took a while to get them, the records, because he- So there, you can get you can a record, um, let me just interject here. You can get the service record of the Marine Corps and which from the Marine Corps History Division, but you can also get a, the entire military file um, from the National Archives, which in his case was about 700 pages the Marine Corps was maybe 10 um, okay. for his service record. Yeah, and I mean, obviously because of his station, he, you know, he had a, a pretty grand <laughs> service record, a pretty right. big one. Um, most people wouldn't typically have that much available at the National Archives, but they would definitely have something if they've been in any military service at all. Okay, so, so, so ju just real quick though, if, if somebody had, uh, grandfather, uncle, grandmother that had served, what would be, or how would you guys recommend for them to, to reach out to the, the right government agency? Would it be, if they knew that it was the army, is there the equivalent? Do you guys well, know? First, of, I think, I think the most important thing really is to go to the national archives and, and look them up, go to the, and you can go online to, nara.gov i think it is i i have a spreadsheet with some links on it that i'm going to send you but okay you can go to that and um you can request as long as you're um, a direct relative um you can request their uh military service records and uh you can go from there and then you can go to whatever individual service has an association or a, or a library they all do all of them do yes. so, we were thinking um, I mean, we've been focused on the Marine Corps Historical Division, but I'm sure the Army, Air Force, Navy, I mean, of course, the um, and the Coast Guard have that as well. Yeah, they um, all do. I mean, and, sorry, Ames, it, it, it was actually because he was in so many different services. Um, you know, we have Coast Guard, Navy, because Navy, uh, Marines right. are obviously a branch of the Navy. So we had a lot of different places to go. The Naval History and Heritage Command has a lot of information. Um, there, there are so many wonderful places that you can access information, starting with NARA is good. And then Ancestry, you can go on to Ancestry and you can access the muster rolls. That's a really powerful tool. Um, and uh, you know, you can find out uh, where and when, you can look up by date, find out where and when your 
your relatives served and who they served with, which will give you leads on other other kind of tentacles, other other places to go for more information. So right. And what I thought one thing that was so neat to me um, is not only do this research of the people in the past, but to find people that are still alive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, 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 through this research, there are only so many Pacific War First Marine Division veterans who are still alive. Sure. And everybody who knows, who researches this stuff, know, tends to know them. But there was one who was my neighbor who served in the Pacific under my grandfather and, or our grandfather. And, um, and you start meeting and then one connects you with another and another. And then you have this network of people you can talk to about what it was like being boots on the ground in the Pacific, like from Guadalcanal to Iwo or um, uh, Okinawa. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Kimberly met someone um, out in California who's 105, a Marine who's 105 years old. Wow. And she met a person, I mean, and interviewed him. Oh. So that's really neat. A human connection too. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things too, that I, following the Facebook group that's out there is a few of the posts where you've had some of these gentlemen that have passed on, but then you've had other people that have submitted, hey, here's a picture that so-and-so handed to us. Here's, uh, I think you had, I mean, there was a video clip or, you know, something taken off of a movie reel of your grandfather <laughs> yeah. recently. Talk about this. This is the coolest thing Kimberly found um, in uh, South Carolina. So, I mean, really a great resource for everyone. Kimberly, why don't you talk about that? So the University of South Carolina works with the, um, <clears throat> The Marine Corps History Division, and they're in the process of of digitizing. I want to say it's like ten thousand films, but it may be even more than that. Of that, the Marine Corps uh, History Division, the Marine Corps Archives has, and but has has not been have not been able to digitize. And so they are digitizing them as they come and putting them up on their website. And it is an amazing resource. Uh, and so uh, I, I had found this website and I was looking at some of the films and I had some, something to add. There were, there were people that weren't tagged in the film that I thought would be helpful if they knew who they were. So since I happened to know, I, I reached out to um, the persons who, whose email was right there and I, and I let them know that I had a few more people to ID and these were the people for what it's worth, you know, I wanted to give him that information. And he contacted me back and he said, you wouldn't by any chance be related to um, Major General William H. Rupertus, because if so, something just came across my desk and we have some more films from China that we're getting ready to upload and they'll be ready to see by this date. And he ended up sending us a link so that we could preview those films. And it was so wonderful because to be able to see moving pictures like right. that from Peking, China in 1937. No, I mean, Shanghai, China. No, it was in Peking, wasn't it, Amy? Peking. Yeah. It was, so, and we didn't have any anything really from that time. We have less and less as you go back further and further. Yeah. yeah. So it was really neat to be able to find that resource. And so we're in close contact with them now and, uh, and that relationship is uh, is strong, and we're looking forward to working with them on you know finding other things. Oh, very cool. Now, have has your research been able to fill in gaps that the Marine History Division had missing? Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I I mean, what we've found, it's not that they don't have it; it's that maybe it's not readily available, or like. Um, because my grandfather died in 1945, he was never interviewed. There were probably after action or after reports or interview, you know, book. I mean, it just, there was silence. So that created a problem and they just moved on. I mean, life, you know, life moves on. And so we, um, uh, and you know, even when I would talk in the, as I've been going through this process, I've talked to Marines who, you know, whatever age they are, they sometimes don't even know that there were Marines in China that were protecting the international settlements in the 20s and 30s, the 10s, 20s and 30s. Right. Um, and they, that those Marines witnessed some of the stuff that was happening with the uh, Japanese in 1937 that was the precursor to world, you know, joining World War II. So it's really, it, 
it's just not up front because we're working on so much other stuff that's present day. I think too, when someone goes in and they're doing research for their book, they're following a certain track. And when they get to our grandfather and the role that he, they play, they may go, they may not go to the primary source material. They're going to uh, journals that have been published or, or things that have been written before. And what happens is, you know, if you keep copying the same thing, if you keep citing the same thing, then you're promoting the same dialogue and the right. same narrative. And it's not an expansive narrative. And, and if they're focused on their book, they don't have time to explore who General Rupertus was. And so it's another reason why Amy felt it was so important to do the book. Well, the other thing we had were, um, you know, back in the day when somebody passed away, people would write letters to the widow. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of very descriptive letters that talked about that person's particular service with him. And of course, we knew who revolved around staff and upper echelons and commanders and all that. So when we would go to Quantico, we would pull out all the significant people that he had worked with and try to find where his name came up. And then when Amy was further into the book, it was mentioned that we need to have some little, add some juice to it with sayings and things like that, you know, little okay. experiences. So we came across um, something and they're talking about he's on one island and he comes to the edge of the water and sees these two guys coming at the boat and they say something funny back and forth. And then we would look at another general who was a big commander and all he had was you know, people's there was nothing personal in his file but it was a huge amount of information to go through and Kimberly went back several times to Quantico and other places to get more information it's almost like all I think from the beginning I think we all knew that because of the amount of information we have and we have now this probably will not be just one. It's probably going to be a two part. At least. Yeah. I at would, least. Yeah. I would think so. Especially from what I know of, uh, the first family and mm -hmm. that pre-World War One, the Haiti experiences and things like that. I mean, the World War II experience by itself in the pre-war lead up would just be huge on its own. So <laughs> I, it's crazy. <laughs> Historians that have been researching this for, you know, 10, 15 years and their books are, you know, a thousand pages and we're, we're following a story, a narrative, one general who's going through this battle, you know, through the water around. Uh, I think it'll be a little more personal, a little more zooming in. Well, and that's that's one of the things I think is missing with some of these. And from a amateur historian, somebody that majored in history, loves it, all this stuff is that when you read a lot of the biographies or you read a lot of whether it's MacArthur or whoever some of these other generals are, it's it's almost very much, you know, service records and after action reports. And then they fill in a little bit where you miss maybe some of the the personal side of things, the the struggles, the, you know, some of the depression or anxieties and, and, and things that we would attribute as like, well, of course somebody went in and were questioning their tactics before this big battle. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe some of that stuff comes out in some of the diaries or, or letters or, or something. Um, but I think it just humanizes that experience a little bit more, especially when you can follow that one general and, and that one person through that entire conflict. You know, so I'm looking forward to reading this and, and seeing how you do this. Now, I have, I have to say that the, you know, it's cool to see China and all that, but I think the most amazing thing to come out of this experience was, um, I don't remember who sent it to us, but somebody sent us a recording from CBS Radio Oh, yeah, like that was 1942 or something. 1944. Yeah, 19, 19 what? 1944, right after right. we come back. So we get to this point, and all of a sudden, it's like, and now we're going to go to General William Rupertus. I'm like, what? <laughs> sure enough, we heard his actual voice. Wow. 
And it was kind of like a soft melange of DC, sort of Southern, but very much the tenor of the way people used to talk back then. And the thing was that he was so proud of his Marines and so assured of what they were doing there. And, you know. And he's get worse the closer we get to Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he thought, Everyone's like, oh, that, you know, Pelu was bad. And he's like, it's just going to get worse. And I know you look at Okinawa. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the life loss there. Yeah. Right. And so on. So but it was just, I mean, I started crying when I heard that voice. It was just like, wow. We've heard his story for so long, but never actually met or heard him. And, his name. and I imagine, too, when you're reading the diaries and you're, and you're seeing their certificates and things like that, you're projecting and, and creating your own voice about what he would sound like. And then to actually come across this clip of what that voice really was had to have been just mind blowing. Yeah. Which I think leads to, um, in the process of people interviewing their elders, the oral diaries, now that we have cell phones and all that are super important. I mean, Amy once, um, Vid taped an interview with one of the people that orbited our family, that knew our family. And she was talking about how it was when the worst war started and Camp Lejeune wasn't even founded and how her husband was involved in, you know, everybody raced down there and got it built. And I mean, it's just the stories you find from, you know, my great aunt would talk about how they crossed from Annapolis Mm -hmm. And a Model T to drive all the way to California when her dad was in the Navy and got reposted. <laughs> wow. Crazy stories, you know? And um, everybody has a story. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think their stories are important. But if you show an interest in your grandparents' story, they'll tell you. Well, and that was one thing I was going to ask you guys, too, is from from this experience, what advice would you have for grandfathers and, and grandmothers that may be sitting there going, well, my story's not very interesting or what would your advice be looking back at, at that family history and then having somebody that says, nah, you know, my, my history is not that important. Well, I would say, um, you know, I think about uh, the fabric of history and where there are holes and by people sharing their stories, they're contributing to the database of history. They're contributing to, you know, creating this quilt that doesn't have holes in it, that, you know, that's a, they're not these silence and these holes in history. You know, it's funny, I was talking, and I'll say this really quickly, I was talking to someone at the orthodontist office that's waiting with my, um, for my children, and um, we are just talking about history and this, and she's, you know, she's like, you know, my great aunt and uncle were Czech spies. <laughs> in World War II, and they were doctors, and they were operating on the Germans, you know, and they have all these diaries in their, you know, attic or whatever, but they won't talk about it, and I'm like, that is a movie, I mean, that is, right. like, you've got to get them to tell their story, or to give you their diaries, because that is, no, who's ever heard that story, you know, that's very interesting, but that's yeah. it, you get it out, you've got to, like Kimberly's um, husband's father did some really cool stuff. And it, it, unless we get these stories down, that's lost to history. We yeah. don't know that he, he did what he did, you know, or she did what she did. Um, yeah, that I, help who you are today. My, my first response would be, yes, it is important. And yes, you do have something to say, even if you don't think that you do. Um, you know, this particular story that we're talking about today is is the story about um you know the life and service of our grandfather who was a general but it doesn't matter who your your relatives are it doesn't matter who your grandfather was in history he's something to your family and he and, it, and it's important for us to have a context of our lives by our by our by the people that came before us and you know the story that we're talking about about our grandfather is also an American story. It's a story about immigrants. It's a story about life. And, you know, we're focusing on World War II for this book, but but really there is so much to tell and so so much to inform um, about what life was like at different times in our history. And so 
you know, uh, Amy mentioned my, my husband's father, you know, he was a, he, he was a Japanese man and they, he was involved in a group that did a lot of diving off the coast of California. And, you know, they would do, uh, uh, free diving and spear fishing, and he was also in the Air Force, and he lived a very relatively seemingly simple life, but he did these amazing things in his free time. He packed parachutes for people and you know, in 1949 or something like that. Um, but he was a good man, and he took his kids camping, and there are great stories around all that stuff. And so it's really, I think it's storytelling is important. It's always been important and, and, and everyone has something to, to say. And I would say, do it if, before it's too late. Yeah. Especially now with COVID, especially yeah. now. Yeah. And every time you see a program by Ancestry, it really makes me sad when somebody says, well, I know my grandfather or grandmother and I think I had an aunt or I think oh. I, they, they have like no, they, there's so many people who have this feeling like they don't know who they are because they don't know the roots of their story, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's important. And the elders in our family hold the keys. Right. They, it, it's that pass on of that, that family history and that, that, that memory. Right. So it's, it's it's learning about that uncle that had to overcome something or learning about the the aunt or the grandmother that had to you know walk 5 miles to to school you know and li- literally one room schoolhouse and and that gives i think the people today that context of you know just what the struggles were that the family has been able to overcome and then also being able to give us our own little shot in the arm a little bit is like, Hey, you know, my grandmother didn't have it so easy. My, my uncle didn't have it so easy. Um, they overcame this, you know, doggone it. I need to pull up my bootstraps and, and just work through this. So I think there's some inspiration there in in those family histories as well. Definitely. So and you can sometimes identify a streak that may be running through you that ran through that person or qualities that inform who you are, your values or whatever. No. A- yeah. And I'll say every time, I mean, this and Heather both have, you know, talked about this, that this project, the more you got into it, the more enor- enormous it became. And a couple of times I got overwhelmed and I'm like, how am I going to figure out this battle? I, you know, I'm not, I'm a civilian trying to figure out a military battle in the Pacific, you know, years ago. And I got so frustrated. I'm like, ah, and I'm like, how can I be frustrated when these young boys left America, got on boats to the Pacific to go attack defended islands. I mean, <laughs> that then they were getting shot at and I'm like, carry on, you know, yeah. You you are nothing compared to what they did. And so you get that kind of yeah. You can you can do anything. Just don't think about what they had to go through and you feel like well god just power on. Mm-hmm. So All right. Well, as we start to wrap this up, anything that I didn't ask you about as far as the methodology, the researching, what you guys have found that you guys want to talk about? Um I had a bunch of notes and now um, I, I will say this. I think it's important before, as you embark on something like this, to kind of figure out how you're going to store what you find, because um, you have to figure out some, if you're doing it digitally, digitally, you should feel, you should figure out some sort of file name convention, some way to link what you're finding to um, to be able to access it later, and um, whether you use uh, if you're working with other people, if you whether you use Dropbox or or Google Docs or something like that, but you you need some way so that you don't get overwhelmed and just throw up your hands in the air. You need some way of um, keeping the uh, the information straight. Yeah, because we were having a conversation yesterday that we're not ready to have yet is great. We have all this information now. What do we do with the documents? Because really, 
the archives and all that, they don't need more documents. And how do we safeguard this? Because you do need the original source documents. You know, you can't just, a copy is a copy, but copies can be manipulated now, right? Right. So we're still having that conversation about and that's that's like kind of the big thing we don't know. Maybe somebody else will figure that out for us. <laughs> well, I, I think we all agree that at some point they'll go to the Marine Corps Museum or the History Division, the important documents. But there may be things that they um, don't need or don't or don't have room for, and and those things that we'll have to figure out where we're going to put them. But um, but we'll they'll definitely be going to some museum at some point so that other people can access them. Well, that's, that's great advice. Now, I know you guys are going to share with me some of the links uh, for the National Archives and I think the Wait, history. Wait, to back oh, up. Sorry. Gosh, Greg, you <laughs> asked us, um, I was thinking because I'm thinking, you asked us about what was most, what we've, what was most exciting about this. Yes. Right. And Heather, you, well, we all talked about this yesterday and I want to chime in about this because we, but we all found things that were like, Wow. And um, or what we thought about us working together on this, Heather. What was your? Well, wait. Doesn't he have to ask the question though? Well, ask the question. So, <laughs> what was the most impactful about getting together and doing this history uh, project together, and and maybe what was most meaningful with with what you guys have been going through? Well, Heather, uh, maybe that I'll start because um, you know we do we've done so much research. Right. And along with what we already have, um, of course, being I, I, my sisters may roll their eyes, but I thought it was cool that we were seeing each other more, talking more, working on this, communicating, um, which I think our parents would have loved, um, you know. Um, but also, um, when you find something in history, your history, guys. So, like, I found something. Like, I was like, where is this hidden? I found something. So I do a lot of research on the battles and I found something about um, uh, the Japanese plan for Pelu, which was just, they had changed their strategy. They were gonna decimate Americans and they did a pretty good job doing it. But I found this plan of how they were gonna build and engineer all their caves and everything. And I was like, when I discovered this, I'm like, is this the deep dark web? <laughs> <laughs> How did I find this? And it was really hard to download. I mean, it almost broke my computer. Um, but I found it and I was like, this is amazing. And that that was just like a big aha. And um, and then when we were all together reading these letters, Heather, what did you you find? So, yeah, uh, well, Amy had a uh, Heather has a good story. I'll let her tell that. But you had asked each of us if we had a favorite story about the process. And, and right. I think Amy uh, mentioned, you know, it's those moments that like put the give you the chills and it kind of your hair stands up on the back of your neck if you have any, I guess. And you get so excited. It's like Eureka, like, oh, my gosh, I just found something. And this is so amazing. And um I think for me, there were a variety of things, but one thing that was kind of really neat was to be able to to come across uh, a radio, uh, a TV broadcast of this, you know, who this guy who was supposed to be the oldest Marine um, living in California, and and I looked in the background and I saw First Marine Division and I saw some emblems from China, and. I just started getting the chills and I thought, oh my gosh, could this guy possibly have served with our grandfather? I mean, no, it's not possible. And then I texted Amy about it and she said, no, no one's still alive from then. And so I went through Ancestry. I went and looked up on the muster rolls. I took this gentleman, William C. White's name, and I put him into the muster rolls and I got some background information. And... Um, and then I wrote him a letter and uh, and I said, could you possibly be the William White that served in China with the uh, China Marines? And um, I got an answer back and yeah. uh, and he was. And so I was able to go up and interview him. And, but that that moment of find, thinking that there was actually somebody still alive that could tell us about that very same time and about what life was like firsthand it was amazing holy cow yeah. so heather yeah. so through our 
process, we were uncovering, you know, letters and funny ones, like my grandfather was writing to my grandmother that, you know, yes, I know you want that mink coat, but I don't have that kind of money right now, you know, that kind of thing. But we came across a letter and the two girl sisters were, you know, in the weeds and I'm like, I was just like, oh, 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 oh. He had written to her the night before they land on Palau or Palau, whatever it's called. Oh, okay. and Palau. And he's talking about how it's dark. The moon's kind of showing through the fog. You can see the silhouettes of the ships next to them. And he's actually saying that he is not feeling like it's going to be as easy as it has been mopping up the islands, that he might lose some men and he's not feeling happy about this. And the, I mean, the picture of this in your mind, right? But the fact that he was actually thinking this because there's all that story about what happened to Pilu is is just it was like it transported you to that moment of just awe, like just you could see that, right? And right. You can you can you can be sure that probably any general in any war is thinking that, right? But to actually read it um, as he's actually writing it, seeing that. Yeah, that, that was pretty amazing. We all sat there at the counter and it was a little difficult to, to decipher his handwriting, but, you know, uh, Heather read it aloud. I think we all took turns reading it aloud, but it was just pretty amazing to have him writing to our grandmother the night before D-Day mm -hmm. and, and Peleliu and, um, you know, what was going through his mind at the time and, and the scene that was set for us was pretty amazing. And it was based, yeah, the scene was incredible. And his, you know, I feel something different as we're pulling up to this. You know, I sense it's going to be a little different. And, um, you know, we've done all we can, you know, pray for us, pray for our men. And that could have been his last letter, just like all the one. Yeah. Right. And, but, but to have that, that sense of even talking about it now, it raised my heart rate, you know, and, and that how you, how you would feel that pressure, you know, it's calm on the sea, but what's ahead is going to be brutal and bloody and awful. And he, I think he had a sense of that. And I, and thanks for sharing that because I think one of the things that, that gets missed in some of the records of, of world war II and, and studying of, of those things are those letters and those diary entries from the generals, right? Because what was jumping through my head is like, Oh, wow. Well, well, this is similar to, these generals from the American Civil War, right? We, we learn a little bit of, of not only do you learn the battles or, or the after words, but you learn it through sometimes those diary entries from different generals, you know, talking about the weather, talking about the conditions. Is so-and-so going to be here on time? What's the, you know, we're facing this kind of enemy or whatnot. And so I think, studying further back sometimes you get a little bit more of that personalization that's taught with the history versus with world war ii you know in high school i think they covered in two weeks and you know and, and, and then it's and then it's just like well and then here was this battle of guadalcanal and we won and okay moving on to the next thing you don't you don't get that so you know this is great having that information because people that do a deep dive into the pacific or deep dive into some of these battles will now be able to have even more of a humanization of of that event so this That's is going like, to be important um, when unbroken came out that was that really gave you insight into that that part of the war you know, and right. the craziness of survival and yeah. yeah, you have to have, yeah, you have to have the personalization to add something to the story. Otherwise it's pretty bland numbers and battles. And you did ask fun. a question in your, um, in your sheet that I, sure. I wanted to address. I know that Amy uh, would feel the same way. I mean, Heather would feel the same way. Um, I will say that 
everyone that we have worked with and reached out to in the uh, history division and in different archives. They've all been amazing. The work that these people do is so valuable and um, they've all been great. I, you, you asked if we, you know, how it, how it has been working with the Marine Corps in, and in particular, they've been very, very helpful. And even with COVID, they've done what they can. They've been shorthanded and, and for instance, the National Archives is closed, but they do have people answering emails every now and then. And um, we're still able to eke out a little bit of information, although I'm still waiting on 400 pages from the National Archives that I ordered last March, but, um, you know, uh, we'll be fine without it. But, uh, but it's been great. And I, Amy, wouldn't you agree? Well, yeah, we've had a great experience with them from day one when I figured out who was the history person at um, the Marine Corps and then talking to her and sharing oral histories back and forth. And finally, the three of us went to um, Quantico and sat in there and pulled the, the research and the, from the archives. And with our white gloves, we went through you know, letters and letters and letters and files and files and files. And, files and so they, they couldn't have been uh, more hospitable. Yeah, very patient too. Yeah, great group of people. Hoorah, <laughs> Marines, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear because I know there's going to be people that are going to be inspired by this, that are going to want to reach out and, you know, figure out who that rifleman was that was their grandfather that was in Europe or the Pacific. And they're going to want to be able to reach out and, and know that they can probably get a good experience, whether it's the Marines or another service branch. Um, right. and, and certainly Absolutely. knowing to go to the National Archives, I never thought about doing a, a, re, a document request from the National Archives for something like this. I always figured, oh, you got to go straight to the Pentagon or, or, or something else. So this has all been great information. As we wrap up, any last thoughts? Uh, and, and again, guys, we're going to do a part two. We'll get that scheduled to really dive into more of the personal effects of the of this journey. But any anything else regarding the methodologies and, and maybe the mechanics of what you guys are doing? Well, I think Kimberly brought up something um, yesterday when we were talking is, you know, you it's it seems overwhelming, but if you just take baby steps and start, just start, um, you know, there are people that are willing to help. There are lots of resources out there and it's better to start and do it than not do it at all. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's just about beginning and making a decision to get it done. You know, I would say, um, you know, we would, if people wanted to reach out to us um, about how to get get started, and I know Kimberly has compiled a list of the resources that we've all used um, over this process that could be helpful as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's, anyone can do it. You don't have to be trained. You know, you just have to be driven to do it, and you don't have to do it all at once. You can take baby steps and do a little bit at a time. Um, everyone's busy and life gets in the way. Life got in the way for us many years and we put it off, but it took Amy starting to get us all like fired up. So, you know, just do something, just start and, and things will unfold. But there are a lot of great resources and, and uh, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And don't be afraid to connect with older people. That's the biggest thing. Um, you know, you think, oh, well, maybe they have this preconceived notion or maybe they think I'm too young <laughs> at our age or whatever. <laughs> uh, but just they, they, they are happy to talk if you create the environment um, and you reach out to them. No, absolutely. That's, that's, that's really great advice. And, yeah, that, that, what, that's one other thing, too, is I'll, I'll have a link to... Um, the World War II Museum, which has a great outline for how to get an oral history from a veteran or how to take an oral history. Um, Library of Congress also has something that's pretty phenomenal and it, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be for a, a military veteran, but um, just really how to get the, uh, an outline of how to go about an oral history. You know, talk to people, veterans groups, great to get involved with veterans groups. Go listen to talks, well, just the, get out there. Or virtual talk. Yeah. Yeah. Virtual. 
Well, that's that's awesome, guys. Now, I'll be sure to grab get those links from you guys. We'll put those in the show notes, so anybody that needs to uh, can get to the website and look at the show notes and be able to get those resources as well. So um, really do appreciate you guys taking the time to have this conversation with me. I know it's going to be a huge help. We're going to do whatever we can to help promote uh, the work that you guys are doing and get the word out about this project as well. So thank you guys for, thank for you. being on. Wow. This was a fantastic interview. I really enjoyed learning about how the sisters have come together, and this has been absolutely fantastic. So just a reminder, I have links on the website, www.cool-grandpa.us. Look up the links. I've put links in here for the Rifleman's Creed. I put links in here where you can get on Amy's Facebook group uh, called Discovering My Grandfather, Major General William H. Rupertus, uh, USMC. So there's links to that as well as following her on Twitter. And you can follow how the, the book's coming along and the research that the sisters are doing. So do me a favor. Be sure to share this with anybody that you know that is involved in family history, that is looking to document what their grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts, uncles, who may have served in the military. There are fantastic links and resources at the webpage that you guys can use to help do your own family research. So do me a favor again. Please share this with friends and look forward to part two that will be coming out in a few more weeks. All right, now remember to be awesome today, folks. Thank you for listening to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with a friend. That's the best way you can help us to expand our community, as well as get the news out about how valuable grandpas are in the lives of those kids. If you'd like to leave me a comment or shoot me a potential topic for this uh, podcast, please go to www cool-grandpa.us look for the comments tab fill it up hit submit it's as easy as that until next time remember to stay cool